Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 56th uh, episode of your favorite uh, Myths, Mysteries, and Majesty channel. Uh, for tonight, I'm especially privileged to welcome Dr. Uh, uh, David Elton Graves, who is a native Canadian. He has been involved in teaching the Bible and archaeology for more than 35 years and retired assistant professor with Liberty University, Rowling Schools of Divinity. Uh, he has taught archaeology at Oxford University in England. He provided tours uh, of the British Museum, traveled extensively in the Middle East, has been involved in the Mount Ararat research. He has been even consulted for National Geographic pro uh, Productions, and he has been involved in so many things, including archaeological excavations at Qumran, uh, Temple Mount, and Shiloh, Israel. And as you can tell only from the very beginning, uh, we have one of those VIP guests, as I like to call them, and I'm so thankful, Dr. Graves, that you have found time for all of us tonight. Uh, welcome, and can you please share something more besides this intro when it comes to you so that we can learn more information? Thank you. Oh, great to be with you, uh, Nicola. I, um, well, I've been involved in archaeology since, um, since high school, and um, started in my church when I found the International Standard um, Bible Encyclopedia in the library and found all these neat pictures thinking, oh, this stuff is real. <laughs> and then I started to uh, study it in, in uh, um, university. Um, my first course was the archeology span uh, of the Bible. And um, I was introduced to Dr. Bryant Wood uh, who's an archaeologist. He was studying at the University of Toronto at that time and Palestinian archaeology. And so I um, I met him and he helped me with all kinds of material on Sodom and Gomorrah. I wrote my paper on it for my first class. And lo and behold, I didn't realize I would be digging Sodom uh, 30 years later. Um, I was supposed to go dig with him that year at McCotter, but it was closed because of the military problems and the war over in Israel. And so um, a friend of mine said, we're going to dig it a new site in Jordan. And that's when I hooked up with, uh, uh, with Stephen Collins. And I was, I was there for 15 years digging uh, in charge of the, um, the Roman area. That was my specialty for my PhD was the Roman period. Um, so I dug there for 15 years and, uh, discovered this, the ancient city, Roman city of Livius, uh, where Herod Antipas was, uh, was living at the time that he beheaded John the Baptist. And I excavated the uh, bath complex that he probably was bathing in um, at that time period. So uh, it's been a wild ride, and uh, I've written 35 books uh, on the Bible and archaeology. And uh, so now I'm retired. and. <laughs> doing a few podcasts and continue to write books. i got another one on the go right now. Um, the Illustrated Dictionary of Biblical Archaeology is what I've got going on now. Uh, the one I just finished is the, uh, the, history of, um, the History of Biblical Archaeology, and that just arrived uh, today <laughs> in the mail to me. So, uh, Especially for the podcast. Exactly, for the podcast. So... Um, that's just hot off the press, and uh, it's available at Amazon with all of my other books. Very nice. Uh, Dr. Graves, uh, for me as a Christian who always likes to learn more and ask questions, uh, the study... Uh, the studies of biblical archaeology come to be very important. It just helped me to understand what's missing when I just read the, the, the you know, the, the biblical passages without me being there, since we are so much cut off from that era and from that culture. So it helps me when I visualize, when I can see certain items and diggings and findings when it comes from either of the Old or New Testament. So that helps not just me visualize, but also strengthens my faith. Uh, mm -hmm. But over the time, I have also discovered that not every Christian is so much interested in the era of biblical archaeology. When it comes to you as the professor and all these decades of experience, uh, can you please tell us why is biblical archaeology important, not just for scholars and nerds and people who like to read and write books, but why is it important for a common average Jewish who just goes to church, minds his own business, seeking God, and that's all? Well, it's very important for us to read the Bible in its context. Culturally, 
uh, geographically, historically. Um, if we don't understand the cultural background, we miss so much about what's being said in the text and what's going on with the narrative. Um, God speaks understandably to man. It's a phrase that my, one of my, Old professors, God speaks understandably to man. He doesn't speak in a vacuum. He doesn't speak uh, in the 20th century to us today. He spoke in the ancient Near Eastern culture to the people that he was speaking to. And so if we don't understand that culture that we understand now from archaeology, we miss so much of what's going on in the biblical text. Yeah, thank you for that. One of the things which I always emphasize on the podcast with a number of guests we have is always to encourage the body of Christ and just regular believers to be encouraged more to study and read and to, to see that there is this beautiful intellectual side of the faith, which of course will not trump the, the personal relationship we have with God and, uh, you know, reading the Bible and praying, fasting, uh, volunteering, all of these things, but that somehow is missing from the evangelical church today. So thank you for encouraging us to be, uh, you know, encouraged uh, to go and use our intellectual uh, you know, gifts and skills to go and pursue the kingdom of God in that context. Uh, for tonight, we'll be talking uh, when it comes to the first and second Kings and first and second Chronicles. So we'll be covering, Dr. Graves primarily will be covering when it comes to the Iron Age and of different artifacts and data that, uh, you know, in his research, he has found all, all these decades. And we'll see how all these data support the Old Testament credibility and accuracy. Uh, Dr. Grace, do you think you want to share your screen now and then I can uh, load it? Sure, I'll, um, if I do the screen sharing, can you see that? Uh, not yet. Uh, do I, have to, I have to screen share it, okay. Uh, present. Slides. No, I can't do the slides. I have to do. <laughs> yeah, just the share screen. Yeah. Share the screen. And I can share. Okay. Perfect. You see that now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So we're gonna be talking about the Iron Age this evening a little bit. Um, this is about six hours of material, but we're gonna try and just dip our fingers into it, our toe into it. Um, the Iron Age runs from about 1200 BC to 586 BC. You might be saying, well, how do you know the dates? Um, the material we're gonna cover is found in three of my books, The Archeology span of Biblical People, um, has footnotes in the book. The Archaeology of the Old Testament, 115 uh, discoveries. And um, the latest one I just showed you, the history of the biblical archaeology. Um, that's just kind of a fun read and the footnotes in that as well. Um, so that, that's the material that we're going to be covering. So dating, how do we know what the dates are? Well, it goes back to a guy by the name of Sir Flinder Petrie. I cover him in my history of archeology. span um, He's the father of uh, modern Egyptology. Uh, he's quite a character, an older gentleman, lived into his eighties actually working in Egypt. And he's the pioneer of pottery dating. Now this is how we do the dating. This is ceramic typology. Uh, he was the fellow that sort of invented this and figured it out. Uh, the story is all in the book. But uh, you can tell that all of these jars are different shapes and sizes and different types of handles. And you'll see there the, the early Bronze Age um, has sort of a ledge handle. They're horizontal handles. Um, the Calcolithic one has a couple of little holes that you just stick a piece of string through. And the others we call some of them we call monkey ear. 
because <laughs> they looked like a monkey's ear. Um, so they all had different shapes and styles and, and sizes. And that's how we do our, um, our dating. So I'm working in a square in at Tel Ol Hamam in 2007. And I find this uh, storage jar. And uh, it's an Iron Age 2A. I know that from the style of the handle and the shape. Uh, here it is in C2 in the ground. We take it down like you would water in a bathtub, all the dirt all around it until it just sort of falls over. Uh, here we are removing it from the square. It was only about eight inches uh, below the surface. And uh, here I am holding it. This is before I had my beard. <laughs> but you can see it is very similar to the... Uh, the terracotta one there, it says Iron Age 2A, 1000 BC. So that's how we do our dating. Um, we can tell uh, where we're digging by the pottery that we find. Here it is again uh, in situ in the ground after it's been cleaned up and I'm holding it. I had to carry it back in the bus on my lap <laughs> in order to preserve it. It's now in the uh, um, in storage in, in Amman, Jordan where they preserve all of our artifacts. But there was not a crack, perfectly preserved, amazing to find a whole piece of this size um, at a site. I think I found about 15 or 20 different uh, um, whole vessels uh, in my career at the, at the uh, site of Tel Olam. Um, before we go further, um, can you see if I just close this for a moment, uh, I wanted to show some artifacts. Um, can we do that now, uh, Nicola? Yeah, yeah. I I can uh, I can uh, close that for a second if you want to show some items that you have in your yeah. Room. Uh, so the way we do our dating, as I said, is from the pottery, uh, but we also use oil lamps. And uh, one of the oil lamps that I have here. Um, is an original, it's an Iron Age oil lamp. So this is from the Iron Age. Uh, you'd put a wick in here, and then you'd put some olive oil or some fish oil uh, in the belly of it. It looks a little bit like a seashell. Uh, and then you you would burn that. Uh, that's your lamp. That's your, it's like a candle. Um, so that's very distinctive shape and style, a uh, little pinched clay, Another one that looks very similar, but it's a different shape and style, is this one. And so this one is um, from a different period, and uh, they, they just pinch it here. But what's interesting about this particular piece is that it's using two different periods. So uh, it's a little bit like the, um, the Mennonites who wanted to bring back the old stuff, and that's what they did. And so this one, you have to you have to be careful when you're digging and finding this. It could be from two different periods, um, so you have to use some coinage to uh, to identify it. Um, this is from the um, the first the first century oil lamp, the time of Jesus. You can see it's a different shape again, different style. And that's from the uh, late first century. And then the Roman period, uh, you have these fancy ones. And there's the wick in it. And uh, it's got a, um, some chariots and horses in it. You know, a little small hole for the oil to go into. Um, and this, this is their lighting for their homes. So again, it's, we can it's honestly a very beautiful design. Those chairs, especially, I, I'm so impressed. Yeah. The other thing we use for dating, of course, is coins, but not for the late bronze because, uh, or the Iron Age, because they didn't have coins at that period. Um, we use what we call scarabs, and we do a wet sifting or dry sifting. And, and these are little scarabs. They have a little um, inscription on the bottom of it. They use them as a stamp. So there's one there, and here's another one. Um, they call them a scarab seal. So they're very tiny, uh, but they have the name of the pharaoh on them. So because we have the name of the pharaoh, we can do our dating uh, from the uh, chronology of the pharaohs, because the pharaohs, the Egyptians were very good 
at um, making sure that they knew the uh, the sequence of their of their pharaohs and the dating. They kept good records. Um, so that's how we do a lot of our dating is off of those uh, scarabs from this time period. Uh, and we found some of them on our sites uh, at Tel Hamam and at Shiloh, both of places we found uh, found scarabs with the names of the pharaohs on them. Um, so that helps us do our, our dating. The other thing we use um, is we also have seals. Uh, these are seals with the names of the kings. I think you can see them there. Jehoiachin, Hezekiah. Yeah, I can see. I can see. They can see. Yeah, Hezekiah, Manasseh. Yeah. So, um, these have been found, um, and in fact, I, I have a few slides of some some recent ones that have been discovered in Jerusalem, uh, with the names of some of the kings on them, and some um, some officials that are very important. So these all help us to uh, do our dating for the time period. I'll go back now to my slides if you want to uh, start that again. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so we have some early alphabet, Hebrew alphabet as well. Um, these are some of the... Uh, early pieces that are discovered 1976 this was discovered um, in Tel Zayat. and it just helps us to understand the um, the early Phoenician Hebrew alphabet uh, from which Hebrew has come from I'm just going to throw these go over them quite quickly so it's it's uh, unlike modern Hebrew. This, these letters are are written from left to right instead of right to left, which is kind of interesting. And this is the whole alphabet in Phoenician. So as I said, left to right, right to left. Modern Hebrew is from right to left. Uh, the Gezer tablet is another one. It's a farmer's calendar. It was kind of interesting. It was found in Gezer. Uh, back in 1908, and um, it helps us understand, again, more of the writing. So writing was, was actually done very early, probably not by everybody, but um, more people than we think were able to write at that time period. Um, a lot of um, Minimalist scholars and skeptical scholars have said, well, they couldn't write back that early. Uh, that uh, Moses couldn't have written the Pentateuch. Uh, well, that's just nonsense because we've got uh, tablets now and, and writing on them that shows show that they could write um, that that early from that, that time period. There was a schoolboy's exercise inscribed on the tablet, uh, and it went through the calendar year as a farmer, just like as mentioned in Deuteronomy land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates and olive oil and honey. Well, it translates it. There's two months are, are they, they actually harvest the, uh, um, the olives and two months they do the planting of the grain and then they go through the late planting of the vegetables a month and hoeing up the flax, and a month and harvesting the barley, a month and harvesting the feast of the grain. Um, and then they do the two months on the vine, uh, vine tending, uh, a month in the summer fruit. So they, their whole year is, is, is around agriculture. They're an agrarian um, society. Um, very much like, I mean, I, I lived in Portugal for a number of years. It's very much like what they do in, in Portugal. Um, they have the same cycle of planting, of reaping. They have the vines. Uh, the grapes, and uh, they go through the whole process. So it's an agrarian culture. And another one is the Gath Ostracon. Uh, this is an oldest, the oldest Philistine inscription ever discovered at a place called Telosafi. It's been excavated. And um, Kirbit Kiafa is another spot. It contains only one period of occupation, the Iron Age. 
built on bedrock. So it's it's built on solid ground. Uh, and that assists us in analyzing the finds so we know what's there. And uh, this is one of the finds, a 70-letter inscription on an ostracon. And again, helps us with understanding the alphabet. And there is also some other objects that they discovered there at that site, Iron Age again, cultic shrine, uh, like similar to the uh, Solomonic Temple. Remember, this is the time period of Solomon that we're talking about. Um, the Eshbel inscription, uh, same name as King Saul's son in First Chronicles. And there is the, uh, um, the repairs that have been done on the storage jar. Again, you tell by the handles, it's Iron Age. Um, and then, of course, the inscription, we can compare the letters. Uh, we know that it's from that time period. So let's talk about King David a little bit. What do we know about King David from archaeology? Uh, this is all um, AI. We didn't discover these pictures, but it gives you an idea. Uh, the Ophil Pethos inscription. This was um, excavated in Jerusalem um, by Alet Mazar. Um, she's now the late Alet. Dr. Mazar, she died. She's actually born the same year I was. Uh, she died of cancer and she did a lot of work here in Jerusalem. And so it's the evidence for the biblical account of Hebrew presence at the time and possible supports David's conquest of Jerusalem around 1000 BC. And she excavated the what's called the Ophel um, excavations. They're just outside of the um, the walls of Jerusalem, the city of David excavations is what they're called. Uh, here we are. Uh, the Ophel excavations are there. You can see the Alaska Mosque. Uh, um, actually, that's the and the Dome of the Rock, both uh, the gold ones, the Dome of the Rock. Um, David's Palace is down below. I got the arrow pointing to it. And uh, here's the Ophel excavations on the south southern wall of the Temple Mount. A lot of work was done there recently in 2023. So just uh, just last year. So I've done a lot of work in this particular area. Um, the structure to my, to the, in the middle of the very bottom is called a mikvot. That's a ceremonial um, cleansing pool They'd have to bathe in that and cleanse themselves before they went into the, uh, the Temple Mount to do their sacrificing of animals. Here it is all cleaned up. We have to sweep everything and clean everything. I didn't excavate this particular spot. I visited it. Um, but the um, people that have been working there last year had to sweep it all. This is what it looks like after they did the excavations in June 2023. Egal Shilo is a fellow who uh, has been overseeing the work there. There's a model, gives you an idea. Uh, this is the Milo, um, what's called the stone step structure, uh, the house of Ahil um, at the bottom of it. They found a lot of, of those seals I was talking about in that particular location. And King David's palace is above that. Um, this is before it was excavated, uh, where that uh, where my label has it, King David's Palace above. And it was excavated by a lot of different folks through a lot of different periods. McAllister and Kenyon and Shiloh, and then, of course, Mazar in 20, 2005 to 2021 before she died. And um, she came from a family of archaeologists. Her grandfather was Benjamin Mazar, a famous archaeologist in his own right. She's written an article in Bar Magazine on Did I Find King David's Palace? Um, she believes she did. I think she did. 
the evidence seems to indicate that. Uh, you can go there today and walk around it. Um, here's my photo of it. King David's Palace is now um, covered over top with a platform where you can visit it. Um, but it's all been excavated above, and that's where, the, where David's Palace, we believe, existed. It's called the Aheel House because it was, uh, uh, we found a number of ostracon or pieces of pottery with the name of Aheel on them. It's also sometimes called the, uh, the, Boule, um, the Boule House or the Seal House. Um, the other interesting thing they found was a toilet. <laughs> they found two, four toilets have been found uh, in the area. Um, here's a reconstruction of what it would have looked like the house of a heel. And um, just a few more photographs. I, here I am with some of the students um, back in 2009. Um, it was originally built by the Jebusites and expanded by Solomon and repaired by Hezekiah. Here is the inside now. Uh, they've got it covered to protect some of the excavations. But uh, in 2005, this is what it looked like. Uh, my photograph when I was there earlier. And uh, this is um, Lane Rittmeyer. He's an archaeological architect that works with us. Uh, many of the drawings and Bible books and Bible, um, some of your study Bibles are done by him. And this is what uh, he, he takes all of our drawings and all the archaeological finds and he puts them together in drawings. He's worked with all the famous archaeologists in Israel. He lived there. He speaks fluent Hebrew. Um, he lived there for many years with his children and family. So what do we know about David? Well, they were doing work at Tel Dan. Discovered in 1993 by Abraham Abiram, and uh, this is called the Tel Dan Stele. It's made out of black basalt, it's written in Aramaic. It's now being preserved in the Israel Museum. I've seen it there. Um, the significance is it mentions eight biblical kings Hazael, Ben Haddon II, Ahab, Joram. Ahaziah, Jehoram, Jehu, and David. So it's a very important um, piece of, uh, of stone. It was found around this gate when they were excavating. Tell Dan. Within the, uh, the city wall. And um, it's a very important because it, it mentions a lot of the uh, events that we find described in the Bible and the dates to the 9th century BC. Commemorates Haziel's victories over Israel and Judah, mentioned in 2 Kings. It confirms David's historical existence because it mentions his name. It appears on line 9, to the ninth line. In Aramaic, House of David, Bet David in Hebrew. And um, dating before 500 BC. First reference to David in a first temple period inscription. And uh, there's where I've got the yellow line around where it says the, uh, the inscription of David. Uh, Lester Greb, professor, says, It is now widely regarded as genuine and is referring to the Davidic dynasty in the Aramaic kingdom of Damascus. So that's a big deal. And as I said, it mentions all these uh, different kings. I'll just go over them quickly here. Um, the deconstructionists have challenged the reading of the Tildan Stele, but the accomplished Anson Rainey, 
uh, the late Anson Rainey. Um, he's actually done some work with us. Um, he says, uh, Philip Davis and the deconstructionist Thomas Thompson can safely be ignored by everyone seriously interested in biblical and ancient Near Eastern studies. Um, because it's accepted now as being a uh, genuine artifact. The other one that we want to look at is the Meshastele, the name of Israel, earliest uh, recorded name of Israel. On a timeline, this is sort of what we're looking at, King Ahab, so 853, 840 BC, um, somewhere in that vicinity. He's in the Northern Kingdom. Discovered by um, Frederick Klein, a missionary. I, I've never been able to find a photograph of Klein. Uh, but uh, this is the gentleman, Charles Claremont Ganu, who is the first individual who published it. He took a squeeze of it. We, we take paper mache and we, we squeeze it into those um, holes. And it ended up uh, being all broken up by the locals. It's now in the Louvre Museum. Um, the reconstruction of it. Well, it was found in Jordan and Debon in Jordan. I've been there. And uh, it speaks of the Moabites and the Israelites' relation in the ninth century. It mentions Mesha, king of Moab, and also the house of David and Yahweh and Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and the son of Omri, Ahab, king of Israel. So all of those names are mentioned on this. So it's a very important, um, significant artifact. And um, he ended up, the local Bedouins broke it all up because they thought it was valuable. Um, but thankfully, he took a, a, a squeeze of it and preserved it and was able to put it together. And soon the Turkish authorities were prepared to send soldiers into Transjordan to take the stone by force. <laughs> Um, I have all that story in my book on the history of archaeology. Um, so they were able to go in and, and actually um, purchase some 57 pieces from locals, and about two-thirds of it has been put together. So you can see it's sort of um, the, the gray and the black areas where they've been putting that stuff together for a while. Here are some of the names on it highlighted. Here is a piece of it. Um, I've underlined a lot of the significant names, Mesha, and Moab, and Israel, and Chemosh, and Israel, and, and so on. I, Mesha, king of Moab. As for Omri, king of Israel, he humbled Moab many years, and his son Ahab also said, I will humble Moab. In my time, he thus spoke. So, and I also mentions there, the house of David dwells in it. So um, a big deal to find a piece that uh, mentions David. Uh, Kenneth Kitchen at uh, the University of Liverpool. Um, he's a great Egyptologist, a Christian. He um, has published in his book on the archaeology of the Old Testament the name David in Egyptian from this Shishank campaign list from this wall in Egypt. Um, I've, I've been there and I've seen it. Um, he points out the possible mention of the Highland Heights of David in the Shishank relief. So here are the three uh, references to David. So we have the Tildan Stele, the Mesha Stele, and we have the Shishank list in Thebes, Egypt. Uh, they mentioned the different areas that they conquered um, in Egypt, the Shishank, and uh, I have it uh, blown up there so you can see it, the cartouche, the name of the pharaoh on it. Actually, that's not the name of the pharaoh in this particular case. It's the name of the king of Judah. So they put the, their leaders uh, in a cartouche. So these are the uh, areas that they have conquered. So here it is. Omri is also mentioned, King Omri. 
Omri is also mentioned on the Black Obelisk. It's in the British Museum. Uh, this is my photograph I took of the uh, Oriental Institute Museum. They have a reproduction there. I've seen the original in the British Museum as well. Um, there's a number of these copies around the world in different museums. Uh, the Akron Royal Dedic uh, Dedicatory Inscription. Now, this is really, really important because um, it's a limestone Canaanite dialect, but it was found in 1996 during the excavations at Tel Mikno um, by Judy Dufan and Seymour Gitton, and it's in the Israel Museum. Now, it's important because there's the two folks that discovered it. It's very important because it's um, one of the five Philistine capital cities described in the Bible, but it was found in location on location at the site. It's one of the few inscriptions we have in situ. Um, in my book, uh, Digging Up the Bible, one of the 12 fallacies that I present, one of the fallacies is that most Biblical sites have been identified using an inscription, and that's just not true. Most sites are identified by their geographic location, mentioned in ancient texts such as the Bible. Ekron is one of the very, very, very few that has a primary inscription found at the site on location. We just don't find signs saying, uh, you know, welcome to Sodom or, or welcome to Jerusalem. Uh, these are all secondary. They're found at another location, at another site, but not found at their spot, um, naming where they're, where they're at. There's only one city, Ekron, and that's the inscription. Only Dan and Gezer and Gibeon and Hatzor and Hesh, uh, Hebron and Shiloh and Jerusalem have secondary inscriptions. That is, they're found at another site. So that's a really big deal. I can't stress that enough. People say to me all the time, you know, you've dug at Tel El Hamam for 15 uh, seasons, 15 years, and you haven't found an inscription saying it's Sodom. Uh, yeah, well, they haven't found that at Jerusalem either, but we know where Jerusalem is. <laughs> So we use the geographic indicators by this river, by this mountain, uh, by this city. Um, and that's how we identify sites. Finding an inscription is like winning the lottery. So we're not likely to find an inscription saying, you know, welcome to Sodom. And as I said, we use the geographic indicators. Another kind of interesting one is uh, Tel Rehov, uh, Amahar Mazar. Um, dug here. He's not, that's, the site's not mentioned in the Bible, uh, but they did find a beehive, uh, the, uh, a large uh, beehive culture, ap apiculture, um, and it's listed as one of Pharaoh Shishank's uh, conquered cities. And, um, and so he worked there. There's the beehive um, as it's been reproduced. I heard a lecture by him at, uh, at our site at Tel Hamam a number of years ago on this, and it was quite fascinating. Um, from the Iron Age 2A strata, so they were, um, there's, you can see all the round cylinders on the ground. Those are all the beehives. Um, and so they are uh, collecting, you know, honey. You know, Israel is the land of milk and honey. So this is a, a perfect example of what they were doing there, um, producing it. Uh, Laish, or Lakish. There's where it's located, west of Hebron. Um, it's important because of the Lakish letters and um, the conquest of Lakish. It dates to the time of the uh, 700 to 600 uh, BC, just before the fall of Jerusalem. Here's an overview of it. Farrell Jenkins, a friend of mine, has some photos. Uh, from the air, there are the two gates, the Iron Age, ga Iron Age gate, and then the earlier gate, gate two. But uh, Lakish letters are found in the Iron Age gate, and these are letters that were um, 
up here by the uh, the gate, there's a picture of it. There's an overview of the whole city, how it was all laid out. Uh, Limlek is also ha found. These are handles with stamps um, with the uh, name of the king on them. Limlek means king. Here we have the Lakish letters were found there. Here's a reproduction of it, what it probably would have looked like. The governor's palace, uh, the supply depot, the horses stables. Uh, here we have the, um, the gateway and there are uh, six chambered gates. Now there was a shrine found in this particular gate, which is interesting. Uh, when they're excavating it, they find an altar here. The horns were cut off the altar. Um, the toilet was deposited in the Holy of Holies in this particular spot. And this goes back to a biblical passage in 2 Kings 10.27, where there was a symbolic desecration of it. So um, when they took the city, the Israelites had cut off the altar horns, and they put a toilet in there to desecrate it. Um, and that's really interesting. There's the stone, the stone toilet that was found being removed by the uh, by the team, the Lakish Gate Shrine. And there's the toilet. Evidence of abolishing the cultic practices and locations of installing a toilet in the place of the altar uh, that was being used for the uh, sacrifices. So the practice of Second Kings is illustrated by Jehu destroying the cult of Baal in Samaria. Um, so we have the practice mentioned in scripture now being found in archaeology with the toilet in the uh, the room. <laughs> Dr. Graves, I just have a question. Something went through my mind. Is this a type of a mockery that we see occasionally in the Old Testament the same way? Yeah. Like when they were like, oh, he's, you know, where, where is Baal? Is he pooping? Is this in a way when the prophets and the people of God in the Old Testament, when they were mocking their opponents by their, yeah. like, I would think it was just a verbal type of, uh, you know, uh, joking with them, sarcasm, but they would actually bring the toilet as like, no, you're defiled, you're dirty. And it, I mean, it brings theological a message, but it's also, it's also, Funny, I can't help it, but not to take it funny. So, is there a combo of both these? Like, it's theological, but it's also humor combined. Yes, yes, and and very symbolical that uh, we are desecrating your altar. It's a little bit like when um, remember with Elijah, the prophets of Baal, and he says, "Well, where's your gods? They must be out um, relieving themselves." <laughs> you know because they're not answering to you. You know, there must be in the toilet somewhere. Uh, that's the kind of language that's used in scripture. And here in second Kings, we have the same thing. And they broke or break, um, break down or demolish the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a drought house. That is a latrine unto this day. And here we find the toilet in the exact location. I just want to say I love this. I, I, I wasn't sure about this data. So now when I read uh, from now, when I read that passage of Baal and was he resting or pooping, I will always imagine this stone toilet from now. Yep, so we awful. found it in archaeology, which is really, really cool. <laughs> so when you read your Bible, you know, it's it's we find it in the ground, you know, just like you read it. So uh, the test indicated that it had never been used. It was the other thing. So it was symbolical. That's what's really interesting. So this is a symbolic reference to um, demolishing or what we think about your God, Baal. You know, he's not, you know, nothing but a latrine or a toilet. <laughs> so the Lakish letters... Um, James Starkey in 1935 discovered them. They're in the British Museum. I've seen them there. Uh, there's a number of them. They give the account of, of Judah's final days before Babylon invasion in uh, 587-86. Uh, 
a prophet is named who may have been uh, Jeremiah on them. Here's Starkey, and I've got a whole section in my book on the history of archaeology about this guy and uh, what he was doing. He, he was actually murdered um, while he was there doing his excavations. Here's my photo, or uh, Greg uh, Galbradson. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. I, I roomed with him during excavations of the uh, British Museum. His photo was better than mine. And, uh, well, there's mine. So there's a couple of photos of the uh, Lakey's letters. Gives the account of Judah's final days. And uh, here's a translation of them. Uh, mentions Yahweh in a number of places, which is interesting, and Azika and Lakish. So it's kind of uh, an important Jeremiah 34 is what it refers to. Um, the Lakish reliefs, of course, are in the British Museum. They were um, discovered by um, Austin Henry Laird, famous British archaeologist, the past century. Uh, at Nineveh, and they're stored now in Jerusalem um, at the British Museum. Sorry, not not Jerusalem, up in in, uh, in London. Um, I've got that uh, slide in the wrong place. Um, so, if you've ever been to the British Museum, there's 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 a room where the where the walls go for almost seems like miles of these um, Assyrian reliefs. Um, beautiful. Here, here, here they are all stretched out. You can't take a photograph of just one of them, but uh, the Battle of the Siege of Lachish is displayed on one of them, um, as is depicted by the uh, by the Assyrians. That's the section there in red, and uh, the Assyrian camp is displayed there. The booty is passed before the king. They they show people being flailed and skinned alive and um, here they are being taken back as prisoners and the king of Assyria, Sennacherib. And these are Judean um, prisoners of war. Here they are being flailed alive. Pretty gruesome. But it was found in Sennacherib's prison in his palace in Nineveh. Um, now it's in the British Museum. Preserved for posterity. Here is a, a depiction of what it would have looked like. Um, copy hangs in the British Museum. See the uh, missiles go on. They're uh, shooting arrows into the into the sky. Um, Isaiah speaks about the event. And uh, we come to Solomon. I guess we've got time just to maybe touch on Solomon for a moment. And um, King Solomon's Mines. Now, King Solomon's Mines is not mentioned in the Bible, but it does speak of the great wealth and the quantity of um, precious metals that he had acquired. And, of course, the question is always, where did he get it from? Um, they've excavated at Timna down um, in the southern uh part of, uh, of Jordan, and um, here we have the, uh, the work that's being done there. They've done some excavations, the Edomite copper mines. And so the Edomite in copper industry was very, very uh, famous in southern Jordan. It was, it was believed to be controlled by David and by Solomon. And here's another uh, photograph of it. All mentioned in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and Kings. Uh, close up of it, some of the work that has been done recently uh, in this area. The Arad, the house of Yahweh Ostrakhan, mentions the house of and the altar of Je Jeroboam, Tel Dan. Uh, Tel Dan is up in the northern part of Israel. Abram Biram had excavated there, and uh, this was the one Jeroboam constructed to house the golden calf altar, first kings, so Israelites could have their own holy place. No longer kept, people had to keep going to Jerusalem to worship. Uh, they could go here 
uh, and they can do their worshiping. Uh, it's the covered high place of Jeroboam where the golden calf was stored at, at Dan. So that's the location of it. And he excavated the altar. Um, another um, ostraca. This is a, an ostraca is a piece of pottery with writing on it. Um, and it also mentions the name of Yahweh, the house of Yahweh. King Josiah of Judah is mentioned on it as well. Uh, Ehuda. Um, the Kirk monolith. Uh, King Ahab of Israel is mentioned on this one. Uh, found at Kirk, displayed in the British Museum in London, and discovered by uh, J. E. Taylor. Mentions Ahab, um, so we have uh, an extra biblical uh, mention of his name and his rules from this time period right here, 850, 800 and 75, thereabouts, 79. And um, there are two of them, uh, the Shalmaneser the third monolith and the Asher Banner Paul the second monolith. They both mention the King um, Ahab on them. And one of the 32 kings is, uh, is mentioned uh, Ahab on this particular monolith. The Old Testament states that Ahab overthrew Ben-Hadad, the Syrian leader, with just 7,000 troops when Ben-Hadad laid siege to Samaria. Here we have the Shalmaneser one. From the Northern Kingdom are mentioned in archaeological dis discoveries. Um, all of these individuals, I have, um, I have all the uh, references and all the material in my book on the archaeology of, of biblical people. So Omri and Ahab and Jehoram, Jehu, Joash, Jeho Jeroboam, uh, Menahem, Pika, Hosea, um, Isaiah, and Sanballat, who is not a king. Uh, but a governor is mentioned also in the biblical or in the archaeological records. So the black obelisk, as I'd mentioned, mentions King Jehu, but it not only mentions King Jehu, uh, but we also have a photograph of him in stone. He's pictured bringing tribute to King Shalmaneser the third in 841 BC. Now this is really, really interesting because it's the earliest surviving picture of an Israelite king uh, that we have. So uh, we get to see what he looks like. It reads, the tribute of Jehu, son of Omri, I received from him silver and gold and golden bowls and a golden vase and all this gold stuff um, and a javelin. Uh, and so here he is right here prostrate before the king Shalmaneser III, the earliest surviving image we have. So one of these panels in the black obelisk uh, depicts an Israelite king, King Jehu. It's a little clearer. Um, I think I might have another one blown up a little better. Yeah, there it is. So you see he sort of has a little toque on, um, a little different kind of hat. A beard, um, different looking beard than King Shalmanassar and, and different kind of clothing. So uh, here we have a king of a, or an, a depiction of a Israelite king laying prostrate. He's basically saying, um, I'll give you all this gold stuff. Don't kill me. <laughs> I just want to say if we would put the message on a side and just look at the obelisk, I think it's gorgeous. It's really beautiful. Yes, yeah, it is. It uh, it's quite something to stand there and and, uh, and look at all the different paintings. They have some of them that have, I think, elephants and rhinoceroses and um, some of the uh, gifts that the, that some of the kings have brought as tribute to Shalmaneser. Uh, but here we have King Jehu coming and um, 
giving his offering to the king. Um, a Lamassu, this is a um, picture of a Lamassu of Sargon II. This is a um, human face on a bull that has wings. So a bulled wing, or winged bull, um, called Lamassu from 722 to 706 BC. Uh, it was discovered by Bota, Emil Bota, and um, Rawlinson was involved in cutting it into two pieces <laughs> in 1849 to bring it back to the British Museum. Uh, there's a number of them. Uh, there's some found in Iraq. I, I don't know the exact total number of them, but uh, um, they were standing on opposite sides of the gate entrance um, to the cities. And so it describes Sargon's capture of Samaria and the destruction of Ashdod in 711 BC. And uh, the writing is in the red underneath the legs of the bull. Um, so we know we know what it says. It's in um, Akkadian cuneiform. And Dr. Gray, can we make a parallel uh, in the Old Testament and say that these entities, Lamassu, remind us of cherubim? Um, yeah, we could. We could, there are, although there's some, some, also some ancient Egyptian similarities too. Yeah, because the people in the ancient Near East, they shared a lot of similar uh, beliefs, cultural similarities. Uh, they exchanged goods. They, they, they intermarried. They were neighbors. They were traveling through each other countries. So I think there is inevitably some similar views in all these ancient uh you know, myths and stories and legends and religions. Yeah, there's a lot of syncretism that goes on. Um, you find it with the zodiacs um, in the floors of synagogues where they shouldn't be uh, putting that kind of stuff, but uh, we're finding it in the Roman period uh, in the first century. Um, we find it with uh, there's a synagogue at Sardis that has um, some eagles. Uh, on the altar, uh, they shouldn't have that there, but it's it's reference to Rome, so they're trying to appease Rome. So there's a lot of syncretism that goes on, and it happened back in the Old Testament period, uh, in this time period as well. So you're correct that there was a lot of borrowing of culture, and again, God didn't speak in a vacuum. He spoke to them in their cultural context, uh, things that they would understand. And can we say that... Uh the same way with Cherubim, can we say that Lamassu were, quote unquote, good guys? They were like preserving the sacred space, God's throne, God's, uh, you know, where he would dwell and things of that nature. Yes, they were the guardians of the gate. So they were, um, they were there. And also to give an idea of splendor and majesty um, entering into, you know, a particular uh, area. The Egyptians had lions a lot of times lining the uh, the street going into the Karnak Temple, and here they had the Lamassu going into the uh, Assyrian and Babylonian um, sites. But the interesting thing is they actually mentioned Omri and Jehu um, on them, so um, we have reference to uh, Israel, and then we have the Sargon, the Annals of Sargon. Um, in the prisms, this is the uh, Nimrud prism. This is found in Khorsabad, just north of uh, Nineveh. Um, Emil Bota, the French archaeologist, discovered in 1843. And um, it mentions Sargon, Tartan, his commander, and Ashdod is recorded in Isaiah 20, verses 1 to 4. So that's uh, interesting. And it's presently in the uh, British Museum. This is the area that Akkad controlled under Sargon. And um, it dates to this period of Ahaz, 725 ish, 720, 
mentioned in Isaiah 20, uh, Ashdod, Sargon, and Tartan. Sargon is mentioned as well in one of these um, building blocks. Uh, it's, it's called a, a foundation brick. Whenever they built something, they would put their names in it. It's in the Vatican Museum. This foundation stone, there's a lot of these all in all the museums, but uh, there's just a couple. Uh, this is another one that mentions Sar uh, Sargon. Fragments of the inscriptions from Ashdod. And uh, the prisms of the annals. These are some of the different samples. There's many of them. Um, the numbers are there, British Museum. Chronicles the expedi expeditions of Sargon II against the Babylonian, the Medians, the Assyrians, and the Pal and Palestine. So it gives us a good indication of what's going on in that time period. And they've been translated. The prism of Sargon II, the foundation text, uh, mentions the house of Omri. And I again settled Samaria more than it had previously been settled. Um, Sennacherib prisms. There's a number of these as well. Um, these were discovered by Robert Taylor. They're in the British Museum. Well, they're actually in a lot of different museums, to be honest. I'll show that in a few moments. But it describes Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem during the reign of Hezekiah of Judah in Isaiah and 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. And Taylor didn't dig it up. He acquired it. Um, sold it to the British Museum in 1855. Uh, it's from the time of Hezekiah, 700. Uh, here's the four different ones that uh, um, are generally known, the most famous ones. The Oriental Institute Museum in Chicago has one. The British Museum has one, has two. Um, it's, one's called the Taylor Prism because Taylor found it. The other one's found the, called the Rassam Prism in the British Museum because uh, um, a guy by the name of Humad Razan had Rassam had uh, um, excavated it. And there's one in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Uh, those are the four different. Uh, and they're all basically identical um, copies of the same accounts placed in different places. And um, they, they speak of Hezekiah of Judah. I have this, the Akkadian, the cuneiform there above it. Um, not that anybody probably reads that. <laughs> the texts of the three are, are, of the four are actually virtually identical. And they record the first eight campaigns of King Sennacherib, and they present the Assyrian versions of uh, what we find in Scripture. And there's the uh, blown up of the cuneiform from the Rassam cylinder, mentioning the name of Sennacherib. And uh, he boasts um, here as to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities walled forts into the countless small villages in their vicinity and conquered them. I drove out of them uh, 200,000 people. That is Hezekiah himself. I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. That's a very famous quote. Um, he pens them up like a bird in a cage. I surrounded him with earthworks in order to molest those who were leaving his city gates. I think it's kind of um, um, kind of significant, I guess, in light of what's happened in the last couple of days uh, in Israel. But uh, inscribed with the first eight military campaigns, um, conquests of many Jude uh, Judean cities. Uh, the deportation of many of them, the late siege to Jerusalem, 
But the Bible says he did not take it. He didn't conquer Jerusalem. Sennacherib omits any mention of the outcome of the siege. He mentions the siege, but it doesn't say who won. <laughs> the Bible says that uh, uh, in 2 Kings, now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them, and the king of Assyria, um, from Lachish to King Hezekiah, with a great host against Jerusalem. Therefore, I said, the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there. So according to the scripture, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't conquer it. He doesn't take, take it, but uh, um, they certainly laid siege. The, the, the Egyptian version uh, sources make mention of Sennacherib's defeat in the conflict with Judah. So that's their story. It gives the credit for the victory to an Egyptian god who sent field mice into the count of the Assyrians to eat their bowstrings unless they fled from battle, according to Herodotus. So again, we have three different accounts, but uh, as one of my professors would say, you can pay your monies and take your choice. Um, I'll go with a biblical account because it's inspired. <laughs> And so the events are presented according to each nation's cultural lens and through how they would see things and interpret things from their cultural background. And we need to realize that, I guess, when we read scripture. Um, media propaganda is nothing new. <laughs> so it confirms Sennacherib was king of Assyria. Hezekiah was king of Judah. Sennacherib captured all of the cities of Judah. And Hezekiah paid tribute to Sennacherib, which included 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah was confirmed to Jerusalem, and unable to make Jerusalem and or take Jerusalem and capture Hezekiah. So that's what we have confirmed with the Hezekiah. Uh, Josiah the second. Well, I'm going to skip down because I would like to look at some of the. Um, I would like to look at some of the things in Jerusalem right now, um, the seals and the bulle. Um, there's lots of other people that are mentioned that are confirmed. They're all in my book, uh, but this is really, I think, significant. Um, now, this is Jerusalem, the Dome of the Rock, the Alaska Mosque, and this is the Ophel excavations. And there is the large stone structure, the Palace of David. And there's a lot of seals, or what we call, um, there's a negative, the seal, and the positive, the bulle. And so um, the Gavati Park parking lot excavations located there. So they've done work there. This is the large stone structure I mentioned. The step stone structure is down below. We already showed photos of those. Um, the Temple Mount Sifting Project. Um, I worked here with Dr. Scott Stripling and uh, Zaki. Uh, he, he was uh, in charge of it when we were there. We took a, a group there to do some, ex some, some sifting. Um, we sift, we dry sift generally all of our finds. Uh, Thomas Winder, a friend of ours at our site, he's doing some sifting of uh, the dirt. Uh, we find all the small pieces, like those little scarabs we're talking about. Uh, here I am doing the wet sifting. So we do dry sifting, but then we take the material and we also do what we call wet sifting. We spray water on on a screen and we go through it and we find any little pieces, like those little like those little seals, uh, we're looking for that kind of thing. And we find them. We find coins, and they found thousands of pieces. I found a coin the uh, day that I was doing my sifting there, a little puta, uh, what we call a puta. In Shiloh, in Israel, where I worked, First Samuel 1, 3, 
we have, uh, here's the site again, one morning, a beautiful in the mornings when you, uh, you drive in on the bus. Um, we do wet sifting. We built the only wet sifting station outside of Jerusalem. Um, and this was put together by a Canadian. He designed it. In fact, he's designing another one. I just talked to him yesterday. Um, he's supposed to be designing another. Uh, um, it's going to be used for bones. So he's going, they're going to be doing some uh, sifting for bones. So we take the water. We put, we put all the wet material into the screen. We, we put water on it, and then we go through it and find all the small things. Um, bit them in. So here is the uh, fractional archaeobotany Shiloh technology. <laughs> That's copyright, so no one can steal it. But um, Stephen Rudd is building this this year to take to Israel. I don't know if they're going to be able to go to Israel this year to, to Shiloh, but uh, they do sifting now for bones. There's a Canadian, our, our bone specialist, Dr. Uh, Greenfield, from the University of Manitoba um, is overseeing the um, inspection of all of our bones. And that's really important because here we have Shiloh. This is where the tabernacle rested. If you know your biblical history, um, after Israel had entered into the land, uh, the tabernacle was there for a while. Um, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the priests were there. And of course, we know that the um, the bones um, indicate what they were eating, and um, the priest only ate the right side of the animal, uh, of the clean animals. So uh, by examining the bones, we can uh, get evidence from the archaeology about the presence of the priest there in, um, in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, I did some restoration there as well. I, I invented this uh, this gun. I found it at the hardware store, used for mortar. It was perfect for injecting our mortar into the between the uh, between the stones in order to do rec restoration and reconstruction uh, of these pre to help preserve these walls. Because if we didn't, they would fall over. And um, so this is something we were um, I was working on. Here they are all preserved. And uh, this is my hand on the, the walls that we helped do restoration of. A lot of sites don't do too much restoration, but uh, we try and do as much as possible. Elaine uh, Drittmeyer has done the drawings for us again, uh, what we found at Shiloh. And uh, here are the things we found in the wet sifting um, at Kirbert El Makader which we believe is the biblical city of Ai. That's the second city that was conquered by uh, Joshua after Jericho was Ai. We believe it's Makadar. And there's a beautiful seal, a scarab seal that we found there. And then Tel, Tel Shiloh, there are uh, three of them that we found. And uh, we found what Tel Hamam. I can't show you what it looks like underneath because it hasn't been published yet. Uh, but it was made out of bone it was from the late bronze period, so it's earlier than the Iron Age. But uh, this is the kind of stuff you find when you do the wet sifting, so it's very important. And so we found um, a bulle with a name mentioned in Second Kings, Nathan Melek, Icar from Second Kings as well, another one. These are all found in Jerusalem, not Shiloh. Um, there's another one up here from Jehukal, Gedaliah, Gemariah, Azariah. Now, those all sound strange to us, but they're all found in Scripture. Um, three of them in Jeremiah and one in First Chronicles. So these are all biblical names of seals found in Jerusalem um, at the area where uh, we believe it was King David's palace. Down below was the house of the Bule, which we think was where the um, the important individuals would have would have left or would have lived. Chamber for the scribes. 
And um, seven of them have been found in this general vicinity. Of the, There's 51 of them in total have been discovered. Now, we can't say for certain if these are the exact people that were mentioned in the Bible, uh, because like today, if you have the name Smith, there could be a lot of Smiths. But uh, we have a saying, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, maybe it's a duck. <laughs> So we have, I think, circumstantial evidence for a number of these. Mataniah, uh, 2 Kings 24 as well, found just outside the uh, southern wall. Now, a number of, of these seals have been found on the antiquities market. And so here are three of them, um, Baruch, uh, Hananiah, and Hanan. Um, when you find it on the antiquities market, you don't find it in place in situ. Um, you can sometimes a suspect whether it's a forgery or not. Uh, you can't say for sure, but when you find it in the location, you know for sure that it's an original. Uh, these are likely originals, but we can't say with all certainty. Um, so I just put those up to show you the. Uh, there are sometimes forgeries. Now, this is kind of interesting. Elat Mazar uh, found one uh, B, uh, Bule with the King Hezekiah on it. Uh, two of them were found in the antiquities market, but they look almost identical to the one that was found in C2. So in order for them to make a copy of them, they'd have to know what the original looked like. And we found the original in 2015 uh, in an archaeological dig. So the ones on the antiquities market are probably um, original. And then he, she found one um, that actually said Isaiah. Whether it's a prophet Isaiah or not, we're not sure. Belonging to, the, uh, to Isaiah the prophet. Uh, how many Isaiah the prophets were there at that time period? Probably not many. And so this is probably um, Isaiah the prophet's actual seal that he would put on documents and uh, found very close to um, the city of uh, or the palace of David. And um, to find all these people all in the same place from the same time period is quite astonishing really. Uh, there's been a lot of debate on this Isaiah one because the last vowel wa is not there, and uh, um, it was a common name perhaps in this time period. Also, part of the Hebrew word for prophet is also not visible because it's broken, um, but I think it's probably the one. Um, I guess that's a repeat. I got that from. Now, the other thing of interest is, is that she found these um, ivory carved spoons. Uh, you wouldn't find these just anywhere. So she found them in what she believed to be David's palace. And so this is something that she would probably, um, you'd find in a palace. You wouldn't find this in a, an ordinary uh, household. So these are, are really special. So this also indicates that this is probably a um, someone of importance uh, who lived there, such as King David, fit for a king. Um, the Northern Kingdom official, Sanballat, there's the Elephantine uh, Temple Papyrus. This is Elephantine is down in Egypt. So we have a name of... Uh, the governor of Samaria and King Darius. Also, we have a bule, a seal with his name on it. And there's the uh, bule of King Hezekiah. And I have all of these individuals um, mentioned in my, my book um, with the archaeological evidence for each and every one of them. Uh, a lot of them are seals, but some of them are... Um, Assyrian artifacts. Well, I think we'll stop there for now. Um, that gives you a pretty good overview. <laughs>
Yeah, thank you. That was, uh, I know when you mentioned you have six hours of material, I was like, oh no, like how we would we be finishing? But yeah, these were uh, a tremendous amount of material that you put into all these slides with all the names, with all the locations, with all the dates. I really appreciate all the hard work that you have decided to share with us. Um, so when it comes, so we, we've been covering the period of the Iron Age. Uh, I know you cannot cover uh, the whole Iron Age uh, in just an hour and a half. No. But when it comes to this topic uh, of Iron Age, uh, what would you say that in your uh, uh, you know, experience as a professor and as a book author and as an archaeologist on the field, what would you say that if there is one, the most important data, archaeological relic, artifact or finding that supports the Bible that you can show to the skeptic that they cannot discard. Do you think there is just one that is most important that we can tell to our atheist friends? Oh, um, well, I think probably one of the most important ones might be the black obelisk, where you actually have a photograph, a picture of a, a Judahite king, King Jehu, um, you can't deny that it's in writing, and we have his picture. Um, we know it's not an art. We know it's not a forgery. Um, that certainly speaks volumes uh, for the time period. So that's an important one. A lot of these seals, I think, are important. Uh, they debate whether it's the actual individual or not, whether it's Isaiah or whether it's. Uh, but uh, you know, who else is is producing these kinds of seals? <laughs> You know, it's, yeah, it's I mean, <laughs> yeah, I was also wondering, 99.99% uh, of people watching this video will never experience what you experienced. And, and this is what I mean. Going actually on the field, being certified, being allowed to be there with a team of other experts and co-workers, digging mm -hmm. there day and night, week after week, month after month, year after year, and finding something so important. And you first, you don't know what is it. You're being gentle. You're being careful. You try to clean it, and then you, and then it dawns to you, oh, this is like from this king or from this prophet or from this person in the Bible. Can you please try to describe the excitement? Because again, we can only read about this or watch videos or podcasts like this one, or go to a museum and be and marvel at something that of such importance. But for someone like you who has, um, you know, in this way, I envy you and people like you because we cannot be there with you. How does it feel when you dig something like that and you're like, wow, this can change the history. This actually finding is so precious to me. Like, can you, I try to imagine it as a kid being taken by their parents into a candy store and tell them you can buy anything and take it home. And they're like so excited. They're jumping and screaming and yelling. So I would just like to hear what is your, how, how would you describe your excitement? Oh, it just goes off the charts. I mean, um, Season one at Tel Hamam, I find the corner of a building. Um, I begin doing my research. Um, I find it on the mod of a map, our site. Um, I ask, what is everybody saying this site is on the mod of a map? Uh, and everybody's saying it's Livius. Oh, Livius. And then I find a, a Roman mile marker up on the Mount Nebo Museum that says six. Roman miles to Livius. Uh, then I find the Roman road and actually walk it and GPS it. And I find another Roman mile marker. Um, and then we're excavating the Roman bath complex. And I find one day a little piece of pottery. I have it actually in my, my curio, uh, one of them. Uh, it's got a Greek inscription on it. Jesus' light shines for all. I have to ask, do you know the date, an approximate date of that item, the last one with Jesus? Yes, I do. Yeah, that would date to the um, that would date to the late first century. It's uh, Byzantine. Uh, these oh were God. being actually probably second century. These are are called eulogia. They're souvenirs that are being manufactured in Jerusalem. And the pilgrims were buying them as they would travel around to look at all of the holy sites. And they would want to drop it into the, um, the hot springs or the bath 
for good luck. Like we'd throw a coin into a fountain. And um, the one that we found, we found two of them, uh, two pieces of them, um, puts our sight on the Roman road from Jerusalem to Heshbon or uh, where Livius was. So it, it, it helped confirm uh, my uh, theory that this was Tel El Ham was Livius. So it puts it on the Roman road. And so for me, this was really a, uh, a significant find. Uh, I found one of these souvenirs from Jerusalem, two of them at our site um, at the bath complex. Because our um, this is a hot spring. We've got five hot springs at our site. And so all around our site, there are hot springs. That's why people are living there. That's why uh, uh, Herod Antipas is living there, bathing in his beautiful bath. Um, I excavated the, one of the rooms and there's steps going down. There's two benches. It's all plastered. Uh, it's a beautiful, uh, we were able to excavate the entire uh, bath. And that's where we found the uh, these uh, two oil lamps. So yeah, Jesus light shines for all. Wow, that's amazing. You're a fortunate owner of something like that. That's so precious. Yeah. Um, Dr. Graves, I'm thankful for this hour and a half that you gave to uh, the audience and myself. Uh, I would just invite the audience to support Dr. Graves. I have included in the podcast, uh, you know, body of the text information of his Amazon link. Please support him by one of his books. I also provided the link to, uh, you know, one of the, some of the articles and videos that he also has on another uh, platform. So go and just enjoy his material, learn, you know, enjoy these things and just see how, uh, you know, all these archaeological data can help you to strengthen your faith as a believer. And if you're watching this either live or in the future as a skeptic and as an atheist, I, I just want to say I do understand fully. I came from that background. It wasn't easy for me to believe in Jesus. I wanted data. I wanted evidence. I wanted some proof. So I fully understand you. I would just say keep asking honest questions. Be honest with yourself. Seek God with all your heart, and also, uh, you know, include your intellectual side of, of of your of your personality fully when it comes to you know pursuing God. Big in archaeology, science, philosophy, any of these areas, they are all beautiful, uh, you know, methods and areas that can help us understand the Bible better. Uh, please also subscribe, share this video, comment. All this helps us when it comes to the spreading the message of gospel and with all these subtopics that we're covering on the channel, uh, it helps us uh, to, uh, you know, break the algorithm and be promoted more and more. So it doesn't cost you anything. Please, uh, you know, subscribe and support this. And we shall be joining you for the 57th episode of uh, your 3M channel next Sunday with another guest. That being said, Dr. Graves, thank you so much for this time. Do you have any concluding thoughts until we, we see you next time? Well, um, when you become a Christian, God doesn't say, check your brain at the door. So uh, people need to think, to be critical, and um, look at the evidence. Um, I've got all the footnotes. I bring all the receipts in my books. So uh, if you want to uh, check things out further, uh, don't just take my word for it. Uh, you can. Uh, um, you can look at the receipts that I provide. <laughs> well, thanks very much for uh, the opportunity and uh, um, God bless. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.